Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast, Tips for Getting Clean Dry Air from Your Compressed Air System, sponsored by Kaiser Compressors. My name is Travis Hessman, Editor-in-Chief of New Equipment Digest, and I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, now before we begin, I just want to let everybody know uh, how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if the slides uh, or audio stop responding at any time, um, all you have to do is hit the F5 key on your keyboard, uh, which will refresh your webinar console, and that should get you reconnected. Uh, now, we do welcome your questions during today's event. In order to submit your questions to today's presenters, just type it into the Q&A window on the left side of your screen, and then hit the Submit button. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during uh, the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation. And today's session is being recorded and will be available on the New Equipment Digest website within the next week for you to review. Uh, we'll notify you by email once that archive is available. Now, on your console, the Kaiser logo, logo is hotlinked. Uh, if you want to visit their website during the webcast, you can click on that logo and a new window will open, which means it will not take you out of the webinar so you can continue to listen and learn while you browse. Now, I'd like to welcome our presenters from Kaiser Compressors. Information on each speaker is available in the Speaker Bio tab in the lower toolbar. Today, you'll be hearing from Grayson Atkinson, System Designer and Supervisor, Neil Meltretter, Engineering Manager, and Liam Gallagher, Product Engineer of Air Treatment. And with that, uh, Neil, I'll turn the mic over to you. Great. Thanks, Travis. So let's get started. Today's webinar we'll discuss ways of ensuring that your compressed air treatment is effective and how to keep it clean and dry for your points of use. I'll explain the types of contamination and touch on air quality standards before turning the mic over to Grayson and Liam. They're going to talk about the consequences of design choices, some tips and best practices, and then we'll have some time for questions. When designing plant air systems, people have different expressions to indicate the overall level of air quality needed. Shop air, plant air, CDA, or clean dry air, instrument air, etc. These are commonly understood but really not well defined. Instrument air is a classic example. Many people think there's a desiccant dryer required, but as we'll see in a few moments, that's not necessarily the case. When we talk about air quality, we're aiming to reduce three categories of contaminants down to tolerable levels, and those are particulates, moisture, and oil. Particulates are solid, such as dirt and dust, and they can be picked up from ambient air and ingested into the compressor inlet. For example, cement plants and wood product plants are usually very dusty, dirty environments, and the dust tends to find its way into the compressor inlet. Another source of particulate contamination is downstream of the compressor from the piping. So rust and scale and iron pipe can build up over time and then flake off and head down towards those points of use. And we'll discuss this more in detail later on. Moisture in both liquid and vapor form is a major concern. When the compressed air is heated and then cooled, moisture forms in and after the compressor. Depending on ambient humidity and temperature, this can be many gallons an hour. Oils and other hydrocarbons can be in either liquid or vapor form, and they can be present in piston or oil-injected rotary screw compressors. It's common for them to be ingested from the ambient environment if solvents, spray lubricants, or other volatile compounds are present. And this is true whether you're using oil-injected or oil-free compressors. Later, Liam and Grayson will address economical ways to remove contamination. There is a set of specifications for compressed air quality. So ISO 8573-1 sets classes for specific levels of particulates, water, and oil. Specifying the ISO class level for each contaminant can provide usable guidelines for selecting compressed air dryers and filters. You take a specific level from each of the three categories to give you the ISO class. Uh, for example, what you see up here, ISO class 2.1.1 would be class two for particulates on the left, class one for water in the middle, and class one for oil. And then you select dryers and filters to meet those particular conditions. But in reality, is that 
<clears throat> Most operators don't have ISO class specifications to use when designing their air system. Equipment providers give only general guidance. ISA 7.3 describes instrument air in terms of system design and specification, but it's still rather broad. It does not prescribe specific levels of air quality. Note that air quality must meet the requirements of the user. The burden is on the user to understand and be aware of the requirements needed for their particular application. This is similar to what's happening in the food industry. Also note that pressure dew point is only 18 degrees Fahrenheit below the minimum operating temperature of the air, which may be a little bit nebulous unless you know your operating temperature. The idea is that if you stay far enough below, you can keep water in the airstream rather than condensing it into the pipes. Now that we've defined a few things, let's talk about what you actually have and how you can tell if it's appropriate. Air quality, it can change over the course of a year or really over the course of a day. Your dryers and filters are also dependent on what you put in. Grayson's going to talk more about the types of dryers and, and Liam about the types of filtration, but in general, inlet temperature, inlet pressure, and inlet flow all have an effect on your air quality. Keep in mind, it's always good to monitor system operation, temperatures, and pressures. If you're getting water downstream, check the operating conditions in the compressor room and also at the point of use, and that can help you figure out how to solve the problem. Further, a couple of key points to look at is where is your equipment installed? Is it inside of a building or is it outside of a building? Is the area heated or is it cooled? Is there enough of that heating or cooling to ensure that your compressor is in actual um, correct operating temperatures? You know, your compressor is going to be a very effective heater. 96% um, of that uh, energy that goes in can be recovered as, uh, um, as usable heat. But if you're not moving the heat out of the room, then that's going to build up over time, and you're most likely going to have a shutdown of your equipment. So um, if there's wide temperature ranges within the plant, that's something else you want to look at as well. Remember that if your temperature starts to reach that dew point threshold, it can cause residual water vapor to also condense. So the picture at the bottom left there shows the end result of such, such condensation coming from your tank. Here's a good example of what we're talking about. Compressor, tank, dryer, filtration, that's what we see in the top right. That's in one area of your facility, so your compressor room. The dryer was a refrigeration type dryer. So if we go back to our ISO air quality schedule, uh, that could be between 38 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit pressure dew point, depending on the type of dryer, the operating conditions, and the design. This pressure dew point level was supposedly fine for the entire facility. However, the end user continued to get moisture downstream in a certain area. Nothing seemed to miss about this particular area or really in the compressor room, but when we traced the piping between those two points, that piping ran through a refrigerated section of the facility and then back out. So the forecast would always call for rain inside and outside of the pipe because there was additional cooling of the air because of the refrigeration section. So that condensation wasn't planned for and it wasn't removed. Lots of different ways to solve this particular problem, one of which was to redirect the pipe around the refrigerated section. Another consideration could be a desiccant dryer for just that section, but you have to consider the operating costs and the overall capital costs. Grayson's going to talk a little bit more about those pros and cons for that last option. Obviously, lots of different ways to solve this particular problem. Here's another example, and I think it, it might be uh, fairly clear from the picture how this customer solved uh, the problem or potential problem. Inside the yellow container shown, there was a refriger re refrigerated dryer, and that air quality level was specified by the customer. So they didn't need anything uh, very special about the air. Always good to choose the best and most effective, uh, cost-effective option. However, the compressed air system was located outside in an area of the country uh, that's subject to large temperature swings and freezing temperatures. And as you can see, there's a tank outside. So temperatures would cause freezing of any condensate that formed outside of the container as those temperatures started to drop. Therefore, heat trace and insulation was adding to the, added to the piping outside of the container 
and plans for heat tracing and insulating any condensate drains or simply bringing those drains back into the container uh, would be warranted. Another option uh, could be a desk and dryer. But again, you have to look at that air quality level required. That brings us to our next point and uh, a few common misconceptions uh, before I hand it off to the rest of the team. First, common misconception is more is better, meaning more or a higher level of protection is better than less. Think of it this way. If your garden has a rabbit problem, you'll build a fence. Will you spend the extra time, material, and labor to build a six-foot fence, or will you go with a smaller fence, which is more appropriate for the job at hand? It's the same with your compressed air system. Choose the right components for your process. Are there consequences of overtreating? Sure. By overtreating your air, you'll have higher capital costs, so you'll have more equipment, and you'll spend more on energy as well as maintenance. And this won't do anything to improve your product quality or reduce your scrap rate when compared with using the right selection of equipment or your application. You know, really, putting in redundant systems is, is probably your best hedge um, against failures or, or product quality issues uh, moving forward as long as your air quality is set correctly with your dryers and filters. In many system design meetings, we hear from customers deciding between oil-flooded and oil-free compressors. In general, these, these discussions center around oil is bad and therefore I need an oil-free compressor. But just because you have an oil-free compressor, it doesn't automatically guarantee that you're going to have oil-free air. So what does it mean to have an oil-free compressor? <clears throat> it doesn't mean that there's no oil in the compressor. It means that the oil doesn't come in contact with the airstream in normal operation. Keep in mind, whatever's in the ambient air is still going to be ingested into that compressor inlet and then flow through the compressor. Therefore, filtration and drying are still necessary for clean, dry air, even in oil-free systems. Also consider that oil-free compressors are usually less efficient than oil-injected, and they cost more up front and have higher maintenance costs. That's not to say that they're a bad choice. They simply should be applied properly. Examples of possible appropriate applications would be pharmaceutical, electronics, as well as uh, chemical processes. A final point, and this is true for systems with oil-free or oil-injected compressors, don't forget about the piping. I've seen this on many occasions. Plants spend time and energy selecting, purchasing, and installing a bevy of compressed air treatment only to have the clean, dry air pass into old, dirty pipes as well as tanks. Some piping materials are a source of contamination that can flake off and migrate to the production equipment. If you need clean, dry air, I can suggest copper or aluminum. Stainless steel is also an excellent choice, but it's much more expensive. It's typically only required for special applications. Whenever possible, piping should also be sized and looped to reduce overall air velocity and pressure drop. Sizing the pipe with future in mind is, is always going to be beneficial. Otherwise, when you expand and add more compressed air to the system, the increased pressure drop can significantly affect scrap rates. And now, I'm going to hand it over to Grayson. Thank you, Neil. So one common example of overtreating is going with a desiccant dryer when only a refrigerated dryer would be needed for an application. Refrigerated dryers are capable of handling the vast majority of applications, approximately 95% of what we see. They also cost less to buy and to operate in comparison with a desiccant dryer. Desiccant dryers use purge air to recharge the desiccant bed so you're constantly losing compressed air to this operation. The desiccant will also need to be replaced as a normal maintenance item, which can be expensive over time. These dryers are really only necessary for sensitive processes, but they're also appropriate when any part of the compressed air distribution is exposed to sub-freezing temperatures, like Neil referenced earlier. Refrigerated dryers are a basic part of many compressed air treatment plans. The majority of condensate held in the compressed air is removed at the compressor after cooler or after the refrigerated dryer, meaning that these dryers are capable of providing a workable dew point for most compressed air applications. In regard to different types of refrigerated dryers, there are non-cycling dryers, cycling dryers, and load matching variants such as VFDs. 
These all use the same principles to cool the air, but have different control methods which offer advantages in different situations. In a nutshell, a refrigerated dryer uses the compression and expansion of a refrigerant to cool down one side of a heat exchanger. Compressed air then flows through the heat exchanger and is cooled down. Because cool air cannot hold as much moisture as warm air, moisture condenses and then falls out of the compressed air. The dryer then removes this liquid condensate from the system, leaving relatively dry compressed air to be used as needed. Non-cycling dryers are some of the more basic refrigerated dryers. They run continuously regardless of the amount of compressed air running through them. This doesn't affect the dew point of the air leaving the dryer, but does cause the dryer to consume a maximum amount of energy on a regular basis. Essentially, the dryer does its job, but doesn't do anything to mitigate any energy consumption. Cycling dryers, on the other hand, are aware of the compressed air supply and are able to activate or deactivate accordingly. This allows them to create energy savings while still providing a reliable dew point comparable to that of a non-cycling dryer. In comparison, cycling dryers can save up to 50% energy against a non-cycling dryer depending on the profile of the compressed air demand. Desiccant dryers use a different technology to provide dry air. Much like refrigerated dryers, there are different types of desiccant dryers, and all varieties dry compressed air the same way. They only regenerate via different methods. We'll get into some of the differences between heatless, heated purge, and blower purge dryers later. In general, desiccant dryers are much more expensive to purchase and operate than comparably sized refrigerated dryers. They do provide a much lower dew point than refrigerated dryers, but at an increased cost. They're typically used when very dry air is needed, such as for food or pharmaceutical production, painting processes, or as Neil said, when pipings run outdoors or through cold environments. It's important to determine whether this level of air quality is necessary before making a purchase, otherwise the air is being overtreated at an inflated cost. Desiccant dryers use adsorption to dry air. We won't get into detail on this process, but essentially there are small desiccant beads inside of the towers that are capable of adsorbing moisture from the air. Compressed air enters the desiccant tower containing moisture, which is then adsorbed by the desiccant material. The air leaves the desiccant tower much drier than when it came in, and the moisture remains trapped in the desiccant material. At this point, some form of regeneration takes place, and this varies depending on which type of desiccant dryer you're using. We'll get into more of this in a moment. Desiccant dryers are also very susceptible to oil contamination as it can coat the desiccant beads and prevent adsorption. So oil filtration is strongly recommended upstream of a desiccant dryer to protect it. Over time, the desiccant material can rub together, causing a very fine dust inside of the desiccant towers. This dust is carried downstream by the flow of air through the dryer. So a dust filter is strongly recommended downstream of a desiccant dryer to prevent this dust from making it to the production process. The first type of desiccant dryer we'll look at is the heatless desiccant dryer, which is capable of drying air to a minus 100 degree Fahrenheit dew point. These variants use a percentage of the dry compressed air, typically about 15 to 20 percent of the rated capacity of the dryer itself, to remove moisture from the system. A desiccant dryer has two desiccant towers. One is actively drying the air and one is saturated with moisture. Over time, the active tower becomes more and more saturated and its drying capacity is reduced. While this is taking place, a portion of the dry air leaving this tower is being piped back into the saturated second tower. This air is much drier than the desiccant material inside of the second tower, so the moisture leaves the desiccant beads and clings to the air itself. The wet air is then purged from the saturated tower, ultimately removing moisture from the dryer. At this point, the rolls of the two towers are switched, and the newly dried tower is now actively drying air, while the other tower begins the regeneration process. It's important to point out that the purge air is essentially wasted when it's discharged to ambient, so this is a relatively expensive method of operation. There are some energy management controls that can be installed on these dryers to help mitigate the expense, but the cost will always be relatively high when compared with other dryers. Heated purge desiccant dryers can provide a dew point of minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit and work in much the same way as heatless desiccant dryers. 
The difference lies in the addition of a heater, then these can be either internal or external, which increases the temperature of the purge air. When the purge air is heated before entering the tower, it can hold more moisture, so it does a better job of removing moisture from the desiccant beads. Consequently, less purge air is required and therefore wasted throughout the process. It's important to note, however, that this heater does consume electrical energy when operating, so you'll need to weigh the cost as well as the availability of power when considering heated purge desk and dryers as an option. Lower purge desk and dryers can also provide a dew point of minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. They work similarly to heated purge desk and dryers with one important distinction. No compressed air is used to purge the towers. Instead of using a portion of the dried compressed air, a blower draws in ambient air, heats it, and uses it to purge the saturated desiccant tower. This allows for a comparatively efficient operation with no wasted purge and a low dew point. Much like the heated purge dryer, however, it's important to note that the blower-heater combo does consume electrical energy when operating, so the cost and availability of power will need to be considered when planning for a blower purge desiccant dryer. IHOP dryers are heat of compression dryers, with the I standing for internal. These dryers can be found in both internal, built into a compressor, or external design variants, and use the heat generated by compressing air to regenerate the desiccant material within the dryer. As floor space is often at a premium in a compressor room, the internal variants are often quite popular. These dryers use the principle of adsorption but replace the dual pressure vessel design with that of a rotating drum. They're capable of delivering a reliable dew point down to minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit without the use of additional heaters or the loss of purge air. It's important to note, however, that heat of compression dryers are only available when oil-free rotary screw compressors are installed in a compressed air system, as they are the only compressors which generate sufficiently high temperatures to allow for the regeneration of the desiccant material. At a given time, approximately two-thirds of the surface area of the drum is being used to actively dry wet compressed air, while approximately a third of the surface area of the drum is being regenerated by high temperature air created by the active compression within the compressor itself. The drum continually rotates to express, expose wet air to fresh desiccant material and to regenerate the areas of saturated desiccant. This has proven to be a very efficient use of the heat that already exists within a compressed air system and may otherwise be wasted. When the various drying systems are compared as above, it becomes quite clear that refrigeration dryers boast the lowest energy costs, denoted by the numbers 1 and 2 in the operating cost column. Heat of compression dryers, blower purge desiccant dryers, and heated purge desiccant dryers come next, with heatless desiccant dryers being the most expensive dryers to operate over time. In regard to capital cost, non-cycling refrigerated dryers end up being the least expensive to purchase, followed by cycling refrigerated dryers, heatless desiccant dryers, heated purge desiccant dryers, and blower purge desiccant dryers. IHOP dryers are ultimately the most expensive to purchase in regard to capital cost. Purchase price and operating costs are important, but at the end of the day, you need a dryer that can do its job and provide you with the air quality you need to do yours. Refrigerated dryers typically provide a dew point of approximately 38 degrees Fahrenheit, which is well above freezing. Refrigerated dryers are followed by IHOP dryers, which provide a minus 22 degree Fahrenheit dew point, which are then followed by heated purge and blower purge desiccant dryers at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The absolute lowest dew point is generated by heatless desiccant dryers with minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It's important to balance the application, cost, and installation requirements such as available space and power when choosing a dryer. In some cases with seasonal variations, a hybrid system may be advantageous, using refrigerated dryers at some parts of the year and desiccant dryers at others. Some manufacturers provide a single package that includes both desiccant and refrigerated dryer technology in one footprint for such applications. Now let's look at a case study where a customer had to make a decision regarding air quality. This particular customer was a steel manufacturer specializing in structural beams and supports. He had two existing aging compressors and a heatless desiccant dryer in his compressed air system. 
His compressed air demand had increased over the past years, and he began experiencing problems with air quality to the point that there was liquid water in his compressed air pipe. The customer ultimately decided to perform an energy audit on his compressed air station, and in doing so, it was determined that his existing desiccant dryer was undersized for the current plant demands. Knowing that a new dryer would be necessary, the energy audit touched on the topic of required air quality and helped to break down the cost of desiccant quality air versus the air quality provided by a refrigerated dryer. The customer evaluated his application and with help from his team in the energy audit, determined that desiccant quality air wasn't required for his process. With this in mind, he purchased a properly sized refrigerated dryer for his system to replace the existing undersized desiccant dryer. Due to the elimination of the purge air required by the heatless desiccant dryer, he was able to purchase smaller compressors and to replace the aging equipment. The compressor replacement reduced his energy bill by approximately 17% and he saved an additional 10% due to the purge air reduction. You can see that taking a good look at your air treatment can not only provide you with the most appropriate quality of compressed air for your application, but can also save you a significant amount of money in instances where overtreatment is occurring. With that, I'll hand it over to Liam for an in-depth look at your filtration. Thank you, Jason. So Neil addressed the types of contaminants you can see in your compressed air system and how they get there, and Grayson covered what types of dryers are available to get sufficiently dry air and how important it is to understand what level of dry you really need when choosing your dryers. Likewise, it's important to understand how clean you really need the air to be when you choose filters. To reduce the number of filters required to begin with, and because dryers and treatment components typically have inlet air quality requirements themselves, filters are typically installed in compressed air headers before the air branch is off. Depending on air quality requirements, and especially if the distribution piping is creating a lot of rust and scale, as Neil pointed out earlier, point-of-use filters may also be installed. Removing the bulk liquid water is done using dedicated liquid separators that can handle the high liquid loads. Liquid separators rapidly change the direction of airflow to fling liquid against the walls of the separator, where it then collects in the bottom of the housing. This leaves us with small solid and liquid particles, and the majority of the solid particles are removed by particulate filters, which often double as coalescing filters to remove some liquid water and oil. These filters exist in varying levels of efficiency to meet different air quality requirements. To talk about oil removal, an important distinction needs to be made between oil aerosols and oil vapor. Aerosols are small liquid particles suspended in the air, whereas oil vapor is oil that's in the gas phase rather than liquid. Water aerosols are removed mostly by dryers, so we're only concerned with removing the oil aerosols here. We want to remove oil aerosols if a process is sensitive to liquid oil. Course. Even with lubricated tools, it's a good idea to remove liquid oil in the, compressed, in the compressed air because your compressor oil and your tool oil don't necessarily have the same lubricating properties and the oil in your compressed air has been mixed with particles in the compressed air piping along the way. Oil aerosols are removed by coalescing filters. These filters cause the aerosols to coalesce into larger drops inside the filter media. The drops then fall off the filter element into the bottom of the filter housing. Oil vapor, on the other hand, won't cause lubrication problems, and in most applications, there's no need to remove it. Removing oil vapor is usually reserved for applications where the smell and taste of oil would be problematic, like breathing air systems. Because coalescing filters work by making aerosols collide and form larger drops, they're not able to remove oil vapor. For oil vapor removal, the compressed air is flowed across activated carbon. The activated carbon is either filled into a tower as granular material, or embedded in the, filter in the filter media of a filter specifically intended as an oil vapor filter. Over time, this carbon loads up with oil and has to be replaced. I mentioned that liquid separators and coalescing filters collect the separated liquid at the bottom of their housings, but obviously that's not the end of the story. If the liquid isn't removed from the housing, it will eventually build up until it carries on downstream and we would have wasted our time separating it to begin with. It also collects in wet side storage tanks and low points in wet piping. If water is not removed from storage tanks, they lose their storage capacity because the liquid is not compressible. Removing water is done via drains, which are available in different types for different compressed air applications. The main distinction is drains which must be 
manually open and closed, and automatic drains which open and close independently. The simplest automatic drains open on timers, and others, level sensing types, only open when enough condensate accumulates. Manual drains are inexpensive, simple, and reliable. At the same time, they're only as reliable as the memory of the person tasked with draining. They can be left partially open, but doing so is really only suitable for very small uses, like pilot air filters, that will only see a few cubic feet per hour, since the drain will be continuously wasting compressed air. Manual drains are best suited to dry filters and tanks, where they're used for inspection and depressurization before service. Time drains operate using an electrically powered timer that tells the drain how often to open and how long to stay open for. The timers are usually adjustable and need to be set to remove the maximum water load they'll see, which means that at lower load periods, timer drains are wasting more air. On the level sensing side, for mechanical float drains, a buoyant float raises when condensate accumulates, and the movement of the float opens the drain valve, removing the condensate. The float then lowers, closing the drain before any compressed air is wasted. These make for very simple level sensing drains, and they don't require a source of electricity to operate. The most advanced drains are the electronic level sensing variety, which use a sensor to detect a condensate level. Like timer drains, these of course require electricity, so you need to account for that to determine if one's applicable for your use. When condensate builds up, the controller opens the drain valve until condensate's removed. These drains are often available with alarms that can send out a trouble signal, alerting you to a condensate removal problem before it actually becomes a problem at point of use. So now we've removed the condensate from our compressed air system, but what do we do with it? Because condensate contains oil, we can't just put it directly into wastewater systems. Treatment's required to separate enough oil from the water to make the condensate safe and legal for disposal. At a minimum, discharged water can't have a sheen or flocks of oil, and you may have additional state and local requirements to be aware of and comply with. There are a few common choices for condensate treatment. When choosing a disposal method, account for the costs of initial purchase, energy, maintenance, and any residual oil waste disposal when comparing your options. The simplest solution is to collect all the condensate and pay to have it removed and treated by a third party. But simple doesn't mean inexpensive. Your condensate's roughly 99% water, 1% oil, so you'd be paying a premium to have raw condensate removed from your facility by a waste hauler. A simple alternative is passing the condensate through an absorbent oil water separator. The oil collects on the cartridge and the water passes through, where it can be safely discharged to a wastewater drain. Once the cartridge is loaded up with oil, it can typically be disposed of in a sanitary landfill. This method typically has low initial cost, no energy cost, no oil waste disposal cost, and a moderate maintenance cost because of the replacement adsorbent cartridges. Some adsorbent cartridge systems also have a pre-separation system, where the portion of oil that easily separates from water is skimmed off the surface before the remaining oil and water mixture is passed through the adsorbent cartridge. These gravity pre-separation plus adsorbent cartridge separators typically have higher initial costs than adsorbent cartridge alone systems. They likewise have no energy costs. They have a lower maintenance cost because the adsorbent cartridge lasts longer, but they do produce some oil waste that you must pay to have disposed of. Then there are evaporative separa separation systems, which work by collecting condensate into a basin, heating it to evaporate water, and leaving behind oil. This method requires a heat source, such as an electric heater, and typically can only be used to remove 90% of the oil and water. Most of the oil can be skimmed off the top of the water, and the remaining 10% of the mixture has oil emulsions suspended in it that require waste disposal. This method has higher initial cost and energy cost, little to no routine maintenance cost, and you'll have to pay to have roughly 10% of that condensate disposed of as oil waste. Regardless of the condensate treatment and disposal method you choose, you have to get all that condensate from your various drains into one place. Getting the condensate from the drain to condensate treatment system means properly routing your drain lines. Drains rely on system pressure to push condensate out of the drain, which is useful for moving the condensate a few dozen feet at most. For small systems with short distances between the two, the lines can run directly between the drain and the condensate treatment, but most systems don't fit neatly in a 10-foot area, 
so we have to account for collection lines. Each drain line should run separately from a drain into a header pipe that's vented to atmospheric pressure. If drain lines are connected before venting to atmosphere, discharging condensate may not have the pressure differential it needs to drain quickly. In the worst case, one drain can push condensate back into the system through the discharge of another. By venting the header to atmosphere, we ensure the greatest differential pressure between the drain and header so condensate gets into the header easily. From there, the header should have a gradual downward slope towards the condensate treatment system so we can rely on gravity alone to carry our condensate as far as we need to. Since the header is vented, cheaper pipe materials like PVC can often be used. Once we reach the oil-water separation system then, if there are multiple oil-water separators, it's very important to have the distribution line for each separator at exactly the same height, so each separator gets an equal share of the condensate load, and there are flow spitters available that perform exactly this function simply. As you can see, clean dry air is a many-step process, and there are common pitfalls to watch out for along the way. So now that we've worked out how to get clean dry air, how do we make sure we keep it? Before we go into that concept further, it's important to understand that air treatment components have lower capacity at lower pressure. Since component sizing is done based on minimum operating pressures, usually in the 100 to 120 PSI range, this means the air treatment is often overloaded during system pressurization. Without an air main charging system, contaminants such as water, oil, solid particles can be swept into the system and the air treatment components will be overrun by very high velocities during initial pump up of the system. Filters and dryers, especially the desiccant and desiccant dryers, can be damaged requiring expensive repairs or replacement, like desiccant changes or filter element replacements. So what is an air main charging system? Air main charging system, AMCS for short, is essentially a valve that's actuated by a controller and installed at the end of a compressed air station, downstream of filters and dryers, typically, but not always, installed before dry storage tanks. What an air main charging system does is minimize this low pressure, high velocity startup period. It does this by monitoring the pressure of the compressed air station and keeping the valve closed until it rises to a system-dependent set point, then opening to allow the distribution system to pressurize while maintaining that upstream pressure. In this way, the compressed air station re reaches operating pressure in the minimum amount of time possible, and the whole system, including distribution piping, reaches operating pressure in the same total amount of time as it would have without the AMCS. Another key benefit of an air main charging system is the common ability to connect to an alarm signal available on many air treatment components, especially dryers or dew point monitors. The AMCS can be programmed to detect that the air treatment component has experienced a fault and closed to protect untreated air from affecting production equipment downstream. In systems where it's more important to guarantee the air supply than guarantee air quality, the AMCS can be fig configured to fail open if it loses power and in that configuration, it would still protect air treatment during system pressurization without cutting off air during production. To demonstrate how the AMCS can ensure that only clean, dry air makes it to production, consider this system, where multiple compressors provide air to two parallel treatment trains, each sized for the total system demand. The dryers split the compressed air load between them, and treated air is delivered to the plant. But, if the drain fails in one of the dryers, if we don't have an AMCS, the water that the dryer condenses can't be removed by the drain, and is simply swept downstream where it wreaks havoc on your process. But, with an AMCS, the fault is communicated from the dryer to the valve via a hard wire, and the valve closes, preventing untreated air from making it downstream. The other air treatment train continues to provide air of the required quality, giving plant staff time to respond to the fault without any equipment damage or loss of production. To wrap up, it's essential that you define what air quality you need, and this means understanding what clean, dry air can be and what is clean and dry enough for you. There's nothing to gain from overtreating your air and a lot to lose. Understand the advantages and costs of different dryer options to select what meets your needs without excessive or unexpected costs. System design should account for the varying conditions in the compressor room, 
in this process. Keep in mind what different filters are used for, and especially the not always well understood difference between oil aerosols and vapor, so you can effectively remove oil vapor if you need to, but avoid over-treatment if you don't. The details are the difference between clean dry air and big headaches. Don't overlook pop proper drain selection, condensate collection design, and condensate treatment. And consider available technology, even if it's something you haven't used before in your plant, to maintain air quality, such as an AMCS. Thanks for joining us. Travis, back to you. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and we are going to move straight into the Q&A um, uh, right now. Um, uh, several of you already um, submitted questions. We're going to get to those, um, but keep them coming, um, and we can uh, fill up this hour. Um, now, while our presenters are answering the questions, we do ask everybody out there to just take a minute to complete the feedback form uh, that appears on the left side of your screen. All right, now with that, um, let's dive in. That's the first question. Um, it's open to uh, the group, whoever wants to take it. Um, and it's a question of cost. Um, how do I know uh, how much a desiccant dryer um, will cost to run? Definitely a good question. And to call back to what Grayson talked about, with desiccant dryers, we have to consider that we could be talking about heated desiccant dryers, would be they blower purge, heated purge, heated compression uh, desiccant dryers, and we've also got heatless. So for heated dryers, such as the heated purge and blower purge, we've got a high energy cost, usually in the form of electric power for heating the desiccant, operating the blower. We've got a fairly high maintenance cost. There's always the valves and switches to account for, but a big one is the desiccant cost because the desiccant the desiccant life is one to two years typically. For compressed air consumption and the energy cost of that, we can have a few percent. It's not as high, of course, as with heatless. For then heated compression dryers, our energy costs, we're, we're using what we'd consider waste energy in the form of heat, so that's not really a cost that we would account for. We do still have a significant desiccant cost, because that is a, a maintenance item. And the compressed air consumption, none in this case. For heatless dryers, the energy cost is very low. You can operate one for less than your hair dryer at home because you're just operating some valves and a controller. Maintenance, we've got valves and switches that are actuating more frequently, so it'll be a little bit higher there. And the desiccant has a slightly longer life, but we need more of it, so our estimated desiccant cost is fairly high here. The biggest cost is certainly the compressed air consumption, usually on the order of 10 to 20 percent of the dryer's rated inlet capacity. So that, that would be how I would expect your uh, operating cost for desiccant dryer to go. Got it. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, another question here is kind of moving into um, uh, measurement and quality. Uh, how can um, how can uh, people out there measure their air quality in their plants? Sure, uh, it's a great question. Um, you have to qualify it too. You know, in in general, uh, if you have expectations for your air quality, then you want to know what that's going to be so that you can figure out what you want to measure. Um, <clears throat> the easiest thing to measure uh, in regard to air quality is the moisture content. So um, <clears throat> if you're looking at a dew point monitor, those are readily available, you know, off the shelf. Um, there's some for refridge dryers, some for desiccant dryers, uh, and then that gives you an idea on what range you're in. Usually uh, when we get a call from a system design standpoint or a, a measurement standpoint and we're doing uh, an air audit, they say, well, we want to measure moisture. And we say, well, why do you want to measure moisture? They say, well, I've got water downstream. We say, okay, well, <clears throat> at this point, you know, we need to figure out where the water's coming from, why you have it there. Putting in a dew point monitor is really only going to ruin the dew point monitor. It's not going to give you much indication of why you're having a problem. So, you know, assuming everything's perfect, uh, you're putting it in uh, during your install, 
pressure dew point, really the best thing to, to do, easiest way to go. Um, there's also um, meters out there where you can you know, measure maybe some oil content as well as uh, maybe particulate. Um, you know, depending on what kind of accuracy you want and, you know, if you want maybe a, a, a real ISO measurement, uh, those uh, instrumentations can cost, you know, $50,000, $100,000. So that, that can be very expensive and the prep for that um, is also fairly large. You know, so if you're just looking for, you know, do I have an issue kind of things, there's some meters out there that you could probably get. Um, you know, from my perspective, you know, dew point is really the, the key measure. I don't know, Liam, do you have anything else to add? Oh, what I would definitely add to that is, as Neil said, the cost for your, if you wanted to do particle testing, can be very high. So a lot of plants will opt to have intermittent testing done by a third party whose primary business is to have that equipment and bring it in every once in a while so you're not paying $50,000 to get an idea of your particle class. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, the next one, you talked about um, measuring the air uh, and um, the dew point there. Um, but is there a good way to know if you have water in, in your pipes before that causes a problem? Yeah, so there's, there's quite a few ways you can do it. Um, the simplest in my mind would be to put some kind of automatic condensate drain somewhere where there shouldn't be water in the system. Um, for example, if you've got a dry tank, so you're talking about after you dry or you're talking about after most of your filtration, you can put uh, an automatic condensate drain on there that has dry contacts on it and basically use that as an alarm. So you plug the drain so that water collects in that dry tank, or if you don't have a dry tank, you could even use a drip leg. Um, as the water collects, the drain will then try to expel the water, and because it's plugged, it, it can't get out, and it'll throw an alarm signal. So where the complexity comes from is how you collect that alarm signal and what you do with it. So you could do something as simple as putting a, a light or a buzzer on the wall so that if the light or the buzzer goes off, you know you've got water somewhere in that, in that location. Um, as Liam alluded to earlier, you can interconnect um, some of these signals with your air main charging valve if you have one after a dryer train so that you, know, you, you shut um, a faulty dryer line and you're not passing that water to the dry tank location. Um, it, probably the best way to do it would be to implement some sort of system master controller and to run all of the alarms back to that so that it's cataloging them and making these decisions for you and recording you know, when it's happening. So you not only know, yeah, I have water in my pipes at this location, but you know it happened this time of the day, this time of the year, and you can kind of try to pin down some of the, the ambient conditions that could be causing the problem. So there's, there's tons of ways to know you've got water, but determining it's another issue, and that's where some of this uh, control and, and recording of these alarms is very useful. Yeah, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with Grayson. I think he touched on, you know, what do you do with it? Um, again, this is Neil. You know, now everything's interconnected. You know, you've got apps on your phone to turn the heat up in your house and, you know, open the garage door and open the house for the kids. So there's, you know, there's a lot of interconnectivity. And uh, I think, you know, there's master controllers that are out there that can help you visualize what's going on in your plant. Um, you know, this typically used to be just plant level, but now it's it, it can be out there on the web, uh, sending emails to pertinent personnel, you know, get out there. So, you know, I, I'm just envisioning the GEICO commercial where the light's going off and no one does anything because no one's there, um, but now you can get that on your phone and, and you can really have some visualization on it. So I, I think that was an excellent point, Grayson. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so we had a question come in uh, about one of the specific solutions that you mentioned in your presentation. Um, so uh, a question reads, how does the Kaser uh, energy control option in a desiccant dryer uh, work? So first with that, we'll make an important distinction between heated and heatless dryers, because they have different energy management systems that operate in different ways. So first for the heated variety, the blower purge and heated purge specifically, they work with a uh, humidity sensor planted into the towers of the dryers. And that's 
that sensor just detects at a certain point in the drying cycle, I have this humidity in my tower, meaning I have this dew point at the outlet of the tower. And so it's waiting for that humidity to rise to a certain point, and that's when it triggers the tower changeover. So the minimum drying time is, rather, the, the minimum regenerating time is the same. But what that allows you to do is extend the drying time for the online tower. It'll wait until that tower has actually become saturated with moisture, rather than if you didn't have energy management, it would trigger the tower changeover prematurely, so sooner than you need to. So, so the idea is that there's, if you have a lower flow than what it's rated for, that it takes longer and ergo less energy to regenerate. Exactly, Could, because at, at lower flow, you've got less water being brought into the desiccant. For then, for the heatless dryers, the idea is the same, that all you're doing is extending the drying time for the online tower. It's just that the way it does it is a little bit different. That system relies on the fact that when you adsorb water vapor onto desiccant, you release heat. And that heat goes into the desiccant and is a measurable heat. And so you've got temperature sensors in it that we use in the heatless dryers. It waits for a certain change in temperature to tell you that you've accumulated a certain amount of water vapor, and that's what triggers the tower changeover. So the basically what you're doing is while you're purging, you're purging the same amount, but it will delay the changeover until the online tower has actually taken up all the water that it can. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So another one. Um, we, we talked a little bit about um, uh, water and dew points for that. Um, somebody's um, going for another uh, quality check here. Question reads, have you evaluated the Fluke II-900 Sonic Industrial Imager for checking air leaks? Uh, and if so, um, could you uh, describe your experience? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I had a little time here in between. This is Neil again to just take a look at it. Um, you know, if uh, my purchasing power in the group here uh, was, was that good, then perhaps we would have. Um, it looks like it does a lot of different uh, different items there. You, you get a lot of visualization, which is great. Um, personally, I have not used that. Uh, we use a, a different model ultrasonic leak detector uh, within Kaser uh, and our groups. Um, and it, you know, in principle, it's great to have leak detection. Um, it's great to do that on a regular basis. It depends on how big your facility is, um, you know, and so we. We don't really talk about it here in regard to, um, you know, analyzing data, but if you're looking at flows over time, especially during nights, weekends, holidays, and your compressed air system is running, you have an idea on how much air is going to that non-productive load. And so uh, Department of Energy rec uh, realizes that, you know, leaks, artificial demand, you know, that's uh, non-productive uses, that's maybe 50% of all the compressed air that you use. So. If you're looking at that value, you get an idea on <clears throat> what's being made uh, and then pushed out to the system for that amount. So if it's you know 30%, which is typical leaks, that gives you an idea. And if you have a thousand CFM total that you know your demand is, and you're at 300, that's a good reason for you to do leak detection. So um, you know, getting back to the question, um, have we used it? No. Is it a great idea to have leak detection as part of you know your toolbox? Absolutely. How often you do it, you know, my mind is how big the leaks are. If, you know, your system is 1,000 CFM and you measure your nonproductive load and it's 30 CFM, then, you know, I don't know that I'd, I'd waste my time with that. But, you know, if you can see where there's a, a, a big demand, absolutely, I'd go for it. Um, I think the, uh, the fluke looks like it might be a, a good choice, but uh, unfortunately I don't have any uh, experience. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, that's some great perspective. Um, all right. So we still have uh, some minutes here, so we're going to plow through as many of these uh, remaining questions as we can. Um, next question came in. Can I shut down my dryer overnight to save money? 
this is Liam here. So, in almost all cases, you can. Uh, w one notable exception, if you're running a minus 100 dew point, you can't. No real way around it. You need to have that dryer on all the time. But considering that that's a, probably a fraction of a percent of all drying applications, the answer is yes. But then my question back would be, what do you gain? So if you have a energy management system, if you have a cycling load-on-load -load dryer, uh, maybe something noticeable on your power bill? Maybe not. Um, so for dryers, sh shutting down overnight, if you have a dryer that's uh, non-cycling and using a lot of energy, yeah, you can shut it down overnight. But if you have no flow through it, if you have some system in place to keep the system pressurized uh, and isolated from leaks, then you, again, you can, and it's case by case on whether or not it's really worth it. Fantastic. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so we have another question here. Um, how important is room temperature to air quality? Sure. Um, I think Grace and I probably have something to say about that because we, we see a lot of those things. Um, you know, typically we get the call and says, you know, I, I've never had any problems in the system, and all of a sudden, you know, now I've got air quality issues. And, you know, typically if, if you're not going out of the compressor room, you're, you're not getting the whole picture, but you really do need to get back into the compressor room to see what those temperatures are. Um, if, if ventilation in the room is not adequate, then you're going to have recirculation, unintended recirculation, and that's going to increase overall operating temperature, which, you know, compressors, whenever you look at uh, what the approach temperature is on your aftercoolers, that's typically at ideal conditions, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, zero uh, percent relative humidity, maybe 36 percent relative humidity. But in general, when, when you're at 100 degrees in an ambient, then your approach temperature is going to increase. That approach temperature means that the temperature out of the compressor, instead of being you know, nominally 80 degrees Fahrenheit, is going to be 120. And that's the limitation of refrigerated dryers. Now, uh, heatless desiccant dryers don't typically care what the inlet temperatures are, but certainly refrigerated dryers as well as heated dryers care a lot. So then they get derated. And if they get derated, that means now they're being overwhelmed with the amount of water that they're seeing, and they can't do their job. So, you know, if I sound a little passionate about it, it's, it's because I am. Um, so it does have a significant effect uh, on overall air quality. Grayson, you have anything to add? I think, Neil, you hit the nail on the head. Um, the, the other thing that you could potentially look at is, you know, in the summer when, when it's hot outside, the air can hold more moisture. You know, it's really humid. So you've got a bigger problem necessarily in the summer than you do in the winter. But then it's really that approach temperature D rate that, that kills you on the correction factor for refrigerated dryers. Um, it's something we see all the time. You know, you, you buy a dryer based on the rated conditions, but then you got to factor in, you know, what's your temperature in the compressor room during different times of the year. And you know, it can be a very seasonal issue, and so you've got to kind of size for your worst case. Perfect. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, and that puts us right up at the top of the hour, um, so we're going to have to call um, call the event now. Um, so with that, I, I'd like to thank uh, Grayson Atkinson, Neil uh, Meltretter, and Liam Gallagher, uh, and, of course, our sponsor, Kaiser Compressors. And as a reminder, um, if you're registered as a group, please add the names and emails of all attendants to the exit survey. So on behalf of New Equipment Digest, I just wish you, uh, everyone out there, to have a productive remainder of your day. Thanks a lot. <laughs>